on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. OU stuff. A lot of reports that OU's not going to the SEC until 2025. And we talk about how the OU guys did at the Senior Bowl. Then NFL Hall of Famer Joe Thomas joins us to preview Super Bowl 57. And we finish up with our winners and losers of the week. Please download it and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right? Our man, Michael Hostie, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, February 8th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades, and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of february people all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now recording this wednesday morning please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment mr layman how we doing sir i'm doing fantastic been a good week so far looking forward to the weekend super bowl always a fun week Remember when we were pre-recording last week and I told you like, oh, it's about to slow down. Don't worry. This is the last thing we have for a couple weeks. There's been a material change. <laughs> it just doesn't ever work out that way, does it? It, it? it does not. We're going to the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. You know, old Creed Humphrey hooked it up with some tickets. We, uh, we are we are going to enter the chaos. So we're doing we're doing waste management, 16th hole on Saturday, and oh, then wow. Super Bowl on Sunday. That's gonna be awesome. I this is I've never really had a desire to go to the game at all. And the way that my wife laid it out to me, she was like, Your best friend is playing in the game. When else, when, when are we, if we don't go now, then when? Right. Yeah. Face value tickets. It's like we were able to book the hotel with points. It was one of those where it was, you know what? Let's do it. I know there's going to be this moment at some point in time on Saturday or Sunday. It'll probably be Sunday where I'm like, this was a horrible idea. This is a <laughs> logistical nightmare, but. I feel good about it. I feel I feel like it was a good decision. I'm excited. As long as you are, I think you're prepared for the absolute S show. It could be trying to get there, get in, get seated, like to actually enjoy the festivities. If you've got it built up like that, I think you're, you're going to be okay. For someone that's going to show up expecting it to be like a normal game, show up around kick, get in there, grab a beverage and sit down. I think those are the people that end up massively disappointed, probably. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I believe it, it's a 4.30 kickoff in Arizona. I think we're heading to the stadium at like noon. Yeah, probably. We're just, smart. we're going to get there and find something to do and have ourselves a time, right? So Nothing wrong with that. I'll report back. I'll let you know how it goes next week. I, I'm really hoping it's a positive experience. You know? It will. It'll be good. I mean, it's a for for Sooner fans and and people that stay close to the program. It's actually a really fun Oklahoma type of Super Bowl where you got multiple guys on both sides. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's gonna be gonna be fun. And is it bad that I might be more excited for the waste management? <laughs> is that bad? I think that's gonna be so fun. That's gonna be interesting. That I've been I've been before. Yeah. So. I, I know I know what the vibes are like, but I went when I was much younger than I am now. Right. Well, the other thing is, and I don't know like, what it's, when's the last time they've had a Super Bowl out there? 
it was the last time I went, but we left. Okay. We actually flew home during the game, and I watched it on a Southwest Airlines flight. Okay, because I was wondering, like, I bet the amplitude gets cranked up. It's always insane, but whenever you've got all those people there for the Super Bowl, I bet the prices for those tickets went even higher. That's crazy. That's cool. It'll be yep. fun. So just wish me luck, man. Hopefully, it, it'll be fine. It'll be fun. All right, let's get to the OU football stuff. And we got to start with all of these reports, right? OU in Texas, according to multiple reports, not going to the SEC until 2025. Pete Thamel from ESPN had the initial report, said that OU in Texas' efforts to join the SEC in 2024, quote, have stalled and a deal is not expected to come to fruition. Brett McMurphy added that OU in Texas and the Big 12 actually reached an agreement for them to leave early, but Fox and ESPN were not pleased with that overall deal, so it is, it's not happening. Ross Dellinger from Sports Illustrated had a very extensive article about the situation and basically said there's two things that are holding this up. Of course, the current media grant of rights contract, right? The current TV deal and the exit fee that OU in Texas would have to pay, but mainly it has to do with Fox's stance in this entire thing. And then he mentioned a 99-year agreement that was signed in 2012 among Big 12 members. I I tend to think that that's not that big of a deal, and that can really get what I like to call lawyered down. You can call it negotiated. It, the lawyers will will get that get that price down, but. What what do you think of all this, Ted? Because this was a lot. This was a lot on a Friday news dump, man. Yeah, I. My first instinct is to think that, in my opinion, nothing has changed. I still believe that OU and Texas are going to be in the SEC next year. I this is this is standard negotiating tactics, right? To when someone feels like you've got a deal, um, one side is is pretty much in agreement on what they want. The other side doesn't like it. Like one of the best tactics is, is just say, ah, just forget about the whole thing, right? We'll just stay with what's current and say the deal is off. I, I think it's a negotiating tactic. I think OU and Texas clearly won out. I think the remaining Big 12 members would prefer that as well. Um, I think that, you know, when, especially whenever you've got the expanded playoff, possibly that year, you, you know, the new Big 12, if you will, would have a really good chance of getting someone in. I guess they would get someone in uh, other than Oklahoma or Texas, which would be big for them. I, I think it makes too much sense for Oklahoma to go to the SEC. Now, I don't know what the deal is between Fox and ESPN, why they don't like it. If I knew that, I could probably offer a little bit better opinion on what I think is going to happen on that end. But I think whoever has the leverage in that deal is just trying to get a little bit better, maybe inventory. It sounds like that was one of the things is, is some future games, non-conference games, and maybe leveraging to get a little bit better uh, deal in that regard. But I still think things are going to happen. Um, what I don't understand is who, why would anyone ever signed a 99 year grant of rights media agreement in a, in a sport that when they signed it in 2012 was rapidly changing. It really has been rapidly changing over the last 20 some years. Why would anyone do that? I so I don't think it's technically a media rights agreement. From my understanding, it's just like almost like a hey, we're all in this together agreement. Because remember, back in 2012, teams had left the Big 12. The future of the conference was kind of up in it's the like air. A, it's like a show of stability to yeah. network partners my, and stuff. And if someone has the answers to this, please let us know. I understand why the other eight schools would sign it. Why would OU in Texas sign that? Right? Just looking at it from the OU perspective, 
Why would they sign that? No idea. Right? Because, I mean, you are, OU and Texas are the cash cows right of this conference. I, I can understand the other eight being like, hey, we need to attach ourselves to OU and Texas. Let's see if we can get them to sign this 99-year agreement. And right, if you break it, it's only supposed to be, according to Dellinger's uh, piece in Sports Illustrated, if you break that agreement, you owe the conference, uh, the members, you owe like two years of gross revenue. So right now, I believe the figure in his article was like, it'd be something like $80 million, which is not insignificant. But I have no clue why OU and Texas would sign that, right? Like, you are the Big 12, essentially. I've got, I've got no problem with the other schools saying, hey, guys, please sign this. We need you to sign this. And, and maybe all that pressure is the reason that they sign it and the instability that was going on with the conference. But I don't know why those two schools would sign something attaching themselves to the other eight. And I'm not trying to disrespect those schools, but I mean, we all know what the reports, you, you look at some of the numbers, OU and Texas are like 50% of the value of the conference. Why would they I, attach themselves to those eight schools for 99 years? I don't understand. Someone's going to have to explain that to me. Well, it's interesting that... <sighs> So that is a that is a a deal that that's not a network deal, grant of rights. That is a that's just a an agreement between the schools, right? Right. It's just like, hey, we're all in this together. That's how I understand it. Okay, but I don't understand if that's the case. What would that have to do with holding up this deal? Because apparently the schools all came to an agreement. It was the network that did not. So it doesn't like, it doesn't sound like that. would. I, I think it's just the, from what I understand, it's just the overall dollar figure. Yeah. Okay. Right. You're going to have to pay the exit fee for breaking the grant of rights. And then on top of that, you're going to have to pay, you know, this approximately 80 million for breaking this 99 year agreement, which I can't believe I had always heard that that was in place, but I, I never really believed it. I was like, there's no way. Oh, you signed that. Like there's no, no chance. And I mean, Dellinger's article, it lays, it lays it out. Like those are the two main bullet points. I completely understand Fox's position in this, right? And just, just from everything I've been able to gather from some of the people I talked to, and I had Brett McMurphy on my radio show, it seems like everyone but Fox wants this to get done. And I totally understand why Fox doesn't want it to get done. Because they want OU and Texas playing on their network in 2024. They don't want OU and Texas going to the SEC in 2024. Because remember, the SEC is going to exclusively be with ESPN. Right? They, they, the ESPN signed that new SEC media rights deal. So the question then becomes, what has to happen for Fox to be okay with this? Right? And it, it seems like the number one thing that Fox wants is games. Like, and remember, you, you go back and you think about the Joe Buck deal to get him into Monday Night Football. Like ESPN gave Fox some games. Mm -hmm. So Fox is supposed to get four games for Texas and four games for, for OU in 2024 on their network. I, I'm not entirely sure how ESPN – makes them feel like they are getting that type of value with some exchange here. I did. That's where my initial thought was, well, everybody, but this one party wants to get it done. So it's going to get done in due time. But then you look at it, you're like, how, how can ESPN give Fox what it wants to feel like it's being made whole in this entire exchange? I, it, it seems, seems really difficult. man. Yeah. I don't know. And that's kind of, like Fox is in, they're in the best position right now, right? And that's why I think this is standard negotiating tactics to where it's just, no, nah, no, nah, we're not, we don't agree. We'll, we'll sit with, we're, we like the current plan and the current situation. We'll just hold tight with that. And that's a very, very strong position to be in and, uh, it forces everyone else's hand. Like when everyone else wants something to happen, 
and you're you're the the you know the fly in the ointment but you've got the strongest position like you they're going to end up getting a really good deal out of it i don't know what it's going to be maybe it involves like inventory and in other leagues perhaps like i don't know because they have those those lotteries i guess or or drafts where they pick games like i wonder if if that's going to get involved i i don't know but i still believe it's going to happen because it just makes too much sense for everyone involved for it to happen even really even fox with what they've got going on in the big 10 and everything it just it it would uh it would it would just be a real clean picture for everyone to transition into what's going to be a new look uh, conference situation with with multiple conferences and a new playoff situation. So I still think it happens, but I I guess we'll never know. And I I still want to like bang my head against the table on this ninety nine year agreement. But like there has to be there has to be something in there. There has to be a reason why Oklahoma and Texas would do it. Um, you know, either they felt like there was some type of easy out, easy uh, lifeboat from it, or I, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the other justification because that seems insane to me. Yeah. Part of Ross Dellinger's article is some people think that it won't, that it won't hold up in court. Right. Cause I guess it would be adjudicated like in Texas and Oklahoma state court. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I don't know anything about that. That's just, that was in the article, but my, my initial reaction to thinking, okay, Fox wants to be made whole. I wonder if ESPN remember, cause the playoff expands in 2024 is a playoff game or two enough for Fox to feel like it's been made whole. I don't know. You got a couple extra, right? If you're ESPN, like, is it, is it worth it for them to get OU in Texas to the SEC in 2024 and to just give up a playoff game or two, like do, do the financials work for that? Yeah. Like we're seeing all the Super Bowl advertising numbers, right? What is it like $7 million for 30 seconds? I don't, I don't know what college football playoff advertising rates are, but I can't imagine they're cheap. So would giving Fox one playoff game do two? I, I, I don't know, but that, that was my initial reaction is think, okay, can ESPN just, can they trade a college football expanded college football playoff game for getting OU and Texas into the sec? Cause that one thing is clear to me with that playoff expansion coming in 2024 ESPN once so you in Texas in the SEC, and so does the Big 12. Because the Big 12 schools, they're going to continue to push to make this work because they want to collect the exit fees from OU in Texas. And let's be real, they don't want to play them. And they don't want OU in Texas taking up playoff spots when that thing expands in 24. Right. So I, I just I just don't know what it'll take for Fox to get on board with this. But I do know this wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. If Venables has some time to build the roster, continue to use that move to the sec as a big recruiting tool to continue to stack talent and depth without having to play an sec schedule in 2024. It, I know OU fans want to get there as quickly as possible. I understand that I do. But Jackson Arnold having a year to start in the Big 12 before having to go and start in the SEC. I'm just saying it would it would not be the worst thing in the world. In fact, it may be just from a development standpoint for the program, it may be the better option. But yeah, I, I know a lot of OU fans don't want to hear that. There's like get us there, the Big 12. We're tired of it. Uh, and I totally get that standpoint, but there are a lot of moving parts in this thing, but just from what is best for the football program, being able to use moving to the SEC as a recruiting tool, but not having to really dive into that schedule just yet. 
not a bad option. Not yeah. a bad option at all, Ted. Well, I wonder if, if, if it would hurt them in recruiting in the near term, you know, that I know they're using it and I know they're talking about it right now. And I think that's helping them specifically on the defensive side of recruiting things. But like, if it's not getting done and you're not going to be there until the 2025 season, which I know isn't that far away, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it hurts you for, for one year in recruiting. Maybe not. I don't know, but I, I still believe that the 2024 season is like, that's the prime year. All right, that's whenever I believe Oklahoma is going to take a really, really big step forward and be able to to compete for a national championship. Like that's the type of team that I think they'll have that that year. But we we'll just have to wait and see. Um, would it be an easier run, at least to the playoff? I don't think there's any doubt. There, there's no doubt about that. But my goodness, after looking at this year's schedule. I, I don't know how much longer OU fans can hold out. That I, I'm sorry, but that home schedule has to be the worst home schedule the University of Oklahoma has ever had in regards to like driving ticket sales. Not in um, you know, uh, I think it's a good schedule as far as trying to get back on on the winning winning side of things and and put together a really good season win loss wise, but. As far as like driving ticket sales and season tickets and stuff like that, it is atrocious. If if you think the 2023 schedule is bad, Ugh. if they're in the Big 12 in 2024 and Brett Yormark and the leadership there at the conference knows that it's their last season, just a feeling, <laughs> just a feeling that the suitors aren't going to get any favors done for him when it comes to what that schedule is going to look like. So, well, yeah, there's really no favors to give. There's I, really no one in the conference that, you know, OU fans are going to look at and say, Oh my God, we've got to get our season tickets this year. We've got Baylor and Kansas state coming to town. You know, there's, it's just not going to, the only thing that's going to drive, the ticket sales and drive the the fan base to have like a real feeding frenzy is whenever you start to get LSU, Bama, Georgia, like any, really any names that you haven't had. I, it doesn't I, matter who it is. Ole Miss people would love to see a home game against Ole Miss. I, I think just looking, and I know we got a 2023 season to be played, but just looking at 2024, it, there's a pretty easy storyline to get fans to renew their season tickets. The guy's name is Jackson Arnold. Yeah, that's true. I, I think that's going to – that that young man's going to sell a lot of tickets, right? I and hope. OU fans, I they hope. are they're, – they're loyal, man. So even as bad as the schedule could look, I, I, I'm not worried about the ticket sales and that. It, I just want there to be excitement among the fan base when it comes to the schedule. And – and that's why I go back to oh, you not putting anything out with the schedule release. I don't know if it was some message to Fox, right? Like, hey, we're not happy. We're not even going to promote this. We're playing on your network. We don't even want our fans to be excited. Maybe that was it. We're going we're to try and convince everyone that we're not playing any games this year. No one's going to be watching on TV on Fox. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. But just the last couple thoughts on it. The SEC... Remember, because UCLA and USC are going to the Big Ten in 2024. ESPN and the SEC, I continue to believe that they do not want the Big Ten to get all the headlines and all the attention that season, especially with the SEC's new media rights deal starting with ESPN that season. I, I can't imagine the Big 12 wants the possibility to even exist that the playoff could expand and that the Big 12 could get two teams in and those two teams could be OU in Texas. They go to the playoff and then they leave the conference. That would that would just not be a great look for the Big 12. And you could say, well, do you really think Texas could be that? Could Oklahoma be that? And I understand with the two seasons that those teams just had, uh, I understand that discussion. But with the way both of those programs are recruiting, they should have damn good football teams in 2024. Yep. So uh, there's a lot, there's a lot at work here. 
but Ted, I'm with you. I am not going to, I'm not going to believe that OU's in the Big 12 in 2024 until I see it, right? Until I see those guys run out on the field against probably Houston on the road <laughs> right. to start the Big 12 slate in 2024. I, I'm not going to believe it until I see it, man. Yeah, I'm the same. I think there's just, there's too much at stake for everyone. It it all lines up perfectly. I think Fox is just doing what any good negotiator would do at the time and trying to leverage the hell out of out of the spot that they sit in, which is really good. Yeah. So with the Big Ten situation, the way it sits, with the current Big Twelve situation, the leverage that they have on ESPN and the SEC. Like they're going to enjoy this spot that they've got right now because they haven't been in it for, you know, very many, very many years. It's typically ESPN and the SEC ruling the the roost. Yeah, I I think everyone is going to be working on Fox to get them to break when it comes to this whole thing. And there's a lot of time between now and then. So we will monitor the situation as we have since. Well, since A&M leaked that this was going to go down. So we'll uh, we'll see where it goes. Let's talk a little Senior Bowl. Four OU players at the Senior Bowl. Ted, I watched everything I could find. Uh, I talked to several people that were down there in Mobile. Were, were you able to watch any of this stuff? I saw some of the uh, – I was able to watch a lot of the highlights coming out of a lot of the OU guys. You know, there's some pretty good Twitter accounts out there that, that send some really good clips of different players and – Saw quite a bit of that. I didn't watch any of the the actual game, um, but I saw some highlights from there. Saw a couple of really nice plays from Braden Willis. So, um, yeah, it looks like there's some guys that did some work. I mean, that continues to be a trend for Oklahoma. Yeah. Eric Gray had himself a really nice week. Being voted the running back practice player of the week for the American team, that's a big deal because people may not realize your teammates – vote for that right so when, when i went to the senior bowl when you went to the senior bowl the defensive lineman of the week gets elected by the offensive lineman so it it is it's undoubted like it's a respect thing and so you've got you know for eric gray to be voted running back of the week by his teammates that's the linebackers probably the safeties like those guys and that's a big deal. And, and I talked to multiple people that were down there watching every practice and breaking down tape and, and talking to GMs and scouts and coaches and all that stuff. And I had multiple people tell me that Eric Gray raised his stock more than every other running back other than Tajay Spears from Tulane. I had multiple people tell me that, that he was that impressive. Like I, I had several people tell me that he looked more explosive and powerful in person than yeah. he did on tape. So clearly he's been working. He's been doing the right things, getting ready for this. Uh, and the thing that I got over and over again from people was that people, they, they knew about the elusiveness, right? The cutting ability, uh, kind of that stutter jump cut thing mm -hmm. that OU fans are used to seeing him do. But the thing that really stood out was his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. He had some big plays in the one-on-one -on -one sessions in practice where he is just, I mean, he's straight up turning guys in circles with his route running out of the backfield. It was crisp. It was efficient. And I, I'm not surprised, man. We've been hearing all year that this guy prepares like a pro, treats everything very seriously. Sounds like he went down to Mobile and had himself a really nice week. Yeah. You know, it's still a it's still a premium. And I think really it's 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 switched outside of a handful of guys like like your Derrick Henry's and you know, there's still a couple of big thumpers out there in the league, but for the most part, like the running backs have turned into more every down players, less specialized guys that you feel like give you a really good um, ability in the running game, but, you know, can do some stuff in the passing game. You can trust in the passing game to get out on the perimeter, get out one-on-one -on -one against backs and uh, linebackers and safeties and do work. I mean, it's a passing league. So if you can show that 
even at running back, you can insert yourself into the passing game and, and be a big plus. That's going to that's gonna be where the dollars show up. So we know we've been able to see him and know that there's some really good things that he could do out of the backfield. So that's not a shock at all. You know, if anything, that's that's where I would expect him to go down there and make his money. Yeah, so who knows um, how the combine is going to go for Eric. Who knows what the draft looks like. Uh, but did himself some serious good down there in Mobile with a good week. Uh, heard similar things about Braden Willis. And everyone I talked to, one word kept coming up from, from everyone. Versatility. I mean, he just did a little bit of everything down there and did it well. Played fullback, played H-back. Right, played in line tight end. They put him in the slot. They put him at their move tight end position. I mean, he did everything that you could ask him to do with the body type and skill set that he's got. And was told he brought blocked really well at all those positions. And I had one guy tell me he stood out like out of all the guys at the tight end position that were being worked at all those different spots, kind of like that hybrid role that he was by far the standout. So did himself a lot of good. And I also, uh, I was told that he caught the ball really well, that some people were surprised that he had as good a hands as he did. And I, I was fired up when he got the invite. I was fired. I knew he would do some good stuff down there. And I was, I was excited to hear all those positive things about Braden Willis. I knew we knew he would. We knew he'd crush it down there. Ted sounds like, sounds like it went really, really well. Yep. Uh, this is this is about habits, man. Whenever, whenever you make it a point to to practice and play with the type of effort that that he has for the last two years, it's easy to go down to the Senior Bowl and just continue to do the same thing, right? Now you got to learn some new drills and learn a some new verbiage and, a, and a, a new scheme. They keep it really simple, but everything else is just par for the course for Braden Willis. Um, Inline blocking, move tight end, fullback. We've seen all of that stuff from him. You know, he hasn't played hand down fullback for Oklahoma, but, you know, he's been there off of motion, which, you know, it's, it's the same thing. Not a shock that he went down there and did really good things there. And he – he fits what people want on their team. They want versatility. They want guys that can do multiple things, that can play special teams, that can, you know, play it in multiple roles. He's going to get drafted and he's going to make a roster. I mean, I'm excited for him. I hope, I hope he ends up in a Shanahan scheme team like Miami or, of course, San Francisco would be. Now, yeah. I don't know what Juszczyk has left on his contract, but a role like that for him would be awesome. Now there's not a ton of those roles in the league, but he's everything you want in a player. Right. I mean, he is. So I, I think he's going to get drafted than pe higher than people realize. And I think he's going to have a long, long NFL career if he can stay healthy. So yeah. I was excited when, when I was getting some of that feedback from people. Okay. Wanye Morris, first and foremost, the measurables are ridiculous. <laughs> he's tall. He's big. His arms are long as hell. Like he has, he checks every box that you want in an offensive tackle. He's tall, but not too tall. And he's got ridiculously long arms. The, the feedback I got was that Wanye got better and better each day. It seemed like he was getting more comfortable, more confident each and every day down there at practice. And some people were just blown away by the way that he can move at that size. And I thought it was smart. He came in a little lighter, right? I, I think he was somewhere in like the 317 area. That's, that's undoubtedly lighter than what he was playing at this season. So I, I think he took the preparation for this very seriously. And when, when you look at what people want to see, from offensive tackles, run blocking is important. And he had some really nice reps where he's dumping guys, putting them on the ground. Now he, he had some swings and misses. That happens. But they want to see you pass protected tackle. Mm -hmm. That's why those guys get paid, right? And from everything I saw, and, and his technique seemed to get better, 
throughout the week, shortened up the set a little bit, made it a little more compact, which I think kept him under control and made him look less panicked. But he handled all kinds of different types of rushers. Well, did well in the one-on-one, especially like they would do this team one-on-one where the where everyone's watching and he was going and he was, I mean, he was absolutely fantastic in those reps. So I, I think teams are going to have questions about, you know, what happened at Tennessee. Probably the number one question teams are going to have is how did Tyrese Robinson start an entire season over you at tackle? That would be my first question if I was a team, but I do think, I do think he did, did himself some serious good down there. I, I really, I think he had a really solid week. Are you uh, not surprised? I almost not disappointed, but is there some frustration there with, with kind of the, the inconsistencies that he put out there whenever you know the measurables are all there and the tools are all there? To to say it's infuriating to me <laughs> is an understatement. Uh, and that's why that's why people that listen to this podcast throughout the season, that's why I express so much frustration with Wanya. Because mm-hmm. he's got it. He's got the ability. It's there. He's got the talent. I I do think he's one of those guys. I won't be surprised at all. Like if he can stay focused and keep the main thing, the main thing, he's going to be a better pro than he was a college player. Yeah. It, it, I now could it be to the level like Elaine Johnson, right? Because everyone, everyone's memory has been skewed by how incredible lane has been in the NFL. And he has been incredible. Like, I, I think he, he's got a case. He's got a hall of fame case building. Right. He was like going to be a late round, maybe undrafted guy until he went and ripped like a four, six, 40, 320 and he, pounds. And he dominated the senior bowl. Yeah. And so like that gets skewed in people's mind because he's been so dominant and so good in the NFL. Could something similar happen with Wanye? I, I don't know if he has Lane's work ethic, but yeah. I, I know this. Getting Wanya Morris out of the structure of college is going to be very good for his performance on the football field. Yeah, I say that a lot of times about there's there's a lot of guys that, for whatever reason, the college, the, the, it's just, it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't click, it just. It's not for them, man. It's not for them. Yeah, it's not for them. Now you go to the the NFL where it's more, every man for himself and the like there is no well there's a lot less of we've all got to buy into this thing together right we all have to get better together you're kind of forced into this this like tight-knit team environment some guys they don't like that they'd rather just be i want to go out and do my thing and here's what i need to accomplish and here's what i get for it straight simple to the point and and there's a lot of guys that go out there and thrive in that yeah uh, i think i think wanya could be one of those guys now only time will tell but i think he's going to get drafted way higher than some people think and there's going to be some people that are like what and it's because there's just not many people on the planet that are that big with that long arms that can move like him mm-hmm. And NFL teams will be willing take to take a on risk that. on that type of guy. Yep. So we'll we'll see. But if he's not a day two guy, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be surprised just from some of the the feedback that I got from his performance down there. Uh, last guy that was participating down there for OU was Jalen Redman. And Ted, want to take a guess about the feedback I received on Jalen? <laughs> Probably some inconsistency in there. Probably some uh, a handful of like, wow, where did that come from? Who is this guy? And you know, that's that that kind of mirrors his his career at OU. Everyone I talked to said there were just some eye opening reps in one on one where you're like, damn. And in at the Senior Bowl, they do run blocking one on ones. 
and there are a couple. He's taking that guard from Florida that a lot of people think is going to be a first-rounder. There's a clip of him taking him like eight yards deep in the run uh, run fit one-on-ones. Mm-hmm. And people are just like, damn, look at this dude. And then there's a couple one-on-run pass rush reps where you're like, damn. Explosion, twitch, all of that. And then I had some guys say, yeah, he had those. And then he kind of just disappeared. Yep. And that's that's kind of his OU career in a nutshell. And I, I am cheering for Jalen. I like Jalen a lot. I, I think that, and he's an Oklahoma kid. I'm always, you know me, I'm always rooting hard for those guys. But he he has to find consistency in his performance. Just has to. He has to, or he's going to have a very short NFL career because his physical attributes are good, but he doesn't have long arms, right? He, he doesn't have particularly, like a particularly great get off. Doesn't have a ton of shock in his hands, or at least not consistently. Mm-hmm. So he's going to have to improve and to, and become more consistent if he wants to stick in that league. Yeah. Well, it it feels like it's, you know, he's got some good tools. Feels like it's always kind of been a motivational thing there. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the spark happens whenever – you know, it's just a, it's a weird thing to all of a sudden have this thing that you've always been able to do. You've always been able to play football. You have always had people that are wanting you to play football that are always, you know, just prodding you and telling you how much potential you have and how good you could be lead you into this this little comfortable place that you'll be able to slide by. And then there's very quickly a harsh reality in the NFL that sets in that. Um, no one really cares about you anymore. They only care about what you could do on the field. And if, if that isn't something that you care about or are really invested in, then no one's going to hang around and continue to pour money into you and attention and, and resources and coaching. They'll just go get someone else. And when that reality sets in, it could be a pretty motivating factor so hopefully at some point he, you know, starts to squeeze all he can out of out of the talent that he's got because we've said it for a long time. He's got some some really good ability. No doubt. All right, let's get to call your shot. We asked y'all what was the most important thing that happened this week for OU football. This first one comes from Brock Spencer, who says the graphic that OU has the most players in the Super Bowl. Let's use it to recruit, recruit, and recruit. We want all them five stars. It is, it's helpful when you're able to throw that up, Ted, right? Six OU players, and we're talking active roster because Tyrese Robinson's on the practice squad for for the Eagles. Got six OU players playing in the Super Bowl, right? You got got Lane, Orlando, Creed, the Bell Dozer, uh, Winchester, and of course, Jalen Hurts. So. Yeah, that is that's helpful, man. Certainly doesn't hurt your case on the recruiting trail. Yep, it's it's you know this is this is the NFL's time to shine, right? And if you've got any, there's all eyes are on the on the National Football League. If you've got any way to kind of wedge yourself in there um, to have some type of stake in it, you do it. And Oklahoma's got, you know, and they're not just down roster guys there's there's big time contributors that are you know driving a lot of the headlines obviously Jalen Hurts obviously Lane Johnson obviously Orlando and Creed uh you know with the Chiefs so there's a lot there that that you could really dig into and and Oklahoma can drive the brand for sure I I think and this is a conversation I had with Orlovsky the other day Jalen Hurts if he wins this game, all of a sudden, let's be real. It's a handsome dude. It's a good-looking man. They win this game, and he plays well. All of a sudden, he's one of not only the most marketable guys in the NFL, he becomes one of the most marketable players in all of sports. 
young, handsome, black, like has a great voice. Like the, the dude, the dude's got a lot going for him. And there are going to be a lot of brands and, and it's still going to be that way. Right. I, I'm not worried about his marketing potential moving forward if they lose this game. But if they win, dude, all of a sudden, Jalen Hurts may be all over our TV screens, like more than Baker Mayfield was. Like he, to me, like he's that marketable. Clean, I don't, like I don't no know. controversy like, at all with him either. Like the guy, every, he checks the box on everything, everything except personality like he's he is a very laser focused no nonsense he is a nick saban robot right which like he's very marketable for everything else but like one of the things that makes most like the guys that really go over the top are like think about like gronkowski and travis kelsey and like Aaron Rodgers and like these guys have like these these personalities that are really really interesting and there's not a whole lot there with Jalen Hurts like and I think it's uh, that's part of like his brand is like just like focused on what he's doing maybe after a Super Bowl he opens it up a little bit but or I, or maybe the brands are like okay this guy is laser focused we're just going to make these commercials like deadpan yeah. and they're going to be hilarious. Yeah. Well, I That's feel good. like there's writers. Yeah, you that can work can, your way into that. Good. That yeah. can, that can work with what, you know, with kind of how hurts is as a guy. Yeah. Yeah. It could be funny, man. Yeah. Yeah. If, if he gets the right, like they're going to, he's going to be obviously marketed like crazy. I agree with, with all that, but like to go above and beyond, there has to be like someone has to find a way to make him really interesting. All the first, the first thing you should do is like one of those Giorgio, Ar Giorgio Armani, like cologne doesn't say, commercials. doesn't say anything. And he's wearing very little clothing, <laughs> just the black and white, uh, you know, images. That's, that's funny. There's like some body of water doing something, <laughs> you know, I, I think, and then I he think has, he nailed that. He says like one stupid word, like, I don't know what it would be, but there's always one. <laughs> some, some, some word that it's just, you know, some random cologne title, right? Yes. That's it. Aqua du jour. <laughs> Probably great. sell a lot of cologne. All right, let's get the birthday shout outs. Welcome to the world. Owen Ray James. Welcome Owen. That's awesome. Happy second birthday to Creed striker Hinkley. Happy third birthday to Jack Caps. Happy 18th birthday to Aiden Silva. Happy 25th birthday to Connor Bridgeport Heard. Happy 26th birthday to Cam Theory. Happy 37th birthday to Travis Lewis. Happy 40th birthday to Jason White. Now, is that tra that is that the Travis Lewis linebacker from Oklahoma? No, can't be. Okay. That's he's because I'm 32. Travis was I was 09. He was 07. So he's only 34 at the most. Okay, maybe 35. So he's All not right. 37 yet. All right, and that's happy. I know Jay White is older than 40. So that's different. Not Jason White. <laughs> happy 40th birthday to Robert Goff. Happy 54th birthday birthday to Brad Cass. Happy 68th birthday. To Tony Silva. Happy 78th birthday to Rex Gampy Corlett. Happy birthday to Krista Sullivan. Happy birthday to Ovi Firth. Happy birthday to Tommy Monaco, Monaco, Tommy Monaco, Tommy Monaco. I think it's Monaco. Happy he birthday to Michael. Oh, Sar man. Sarche or Sarchet? I I'm going Sarche, S A R C H E T Sarche. This goes. I, it it sounds great. Michael Sarche, happy birthday. If it's Sarchet, he's sitting there going, "Really, guys? Come on, guys. I mean, come on, guys. You tried to make it that fancy. <laughs> All right, let's talk to a Hall of Famer. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. 
Loves has over 600 locations in 42 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Loves has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. The coffee is fantastic. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. And a little birdie told me there may be some fuel discounts in the Loves Connect app Ooh. now. Okay. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Loves Travel Stops. For a full list of what Loves has to offer, visit loves.com. Opalus Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma breakdown merchandise, as seen on Sports Center with Stanford Steve. Yeah, that was, dude, that was so cool. It was, it was. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opalusclothing.com. That's O P O L I S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T E D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all of the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opalusclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. All right, let's preview the Super Bowl with NFL Hall of Famer, Joe Thomas. It is our pleasure to be joined by one of the best football players ever. Joe Thomas is in the house. What's going on, big guy? Not too much, guys. Thanks for having me on your show. So we've got you on to preview the Super Bowl because, you know, you 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 have really dove into the analyst game with your stuff when it comes to podcasting, stuff you do for NFL Network, all of that. But it, it's a rather significant week for you individually. So the NFL Hall of Fame class of 2023 will be announced on Thursday. You are on the ballot. We are recording this on Wednesday. I know that you are going to be elected to the Hall of Fame. Do you know? Do you already know? Tell us. Tell I was going to say, so uh, what you know is not because I've told you. Let's, let's make Correct. that clear. I, because but I think it's I'm not supposed you are to be a, a spoiler. You are a slam dunk first ballot Hall of Thank Famer, you. and everyone knows it. What are the rules I, behind it? Can, can you not say yes. you can't say anything? Yes, I you? appreciate all I can tell you is the announcement is Thursday night and all the members of the finalist class are asked not to say anything about it until Thursday night. But I'm getting my family ready right now to head to Arizona to go down there for the festivities. And we're very excited about whatever happens. It's been an exciting week. It's been a busy week. Uh, but I always make time for a couple good friends like you guys to come on your show and preview the biggest game in town, which is Sunday. And I hope I've got a big smile on my face still on Sunday after the Thursday night announcement. I'm sure you will. Now, is this one of those things that I, was there ever a point in your career where you started to think about the Hall of Fame? Or has that just been um, a post-career thing? No. Uh, when I was a rookie in Cleveland, I remember in OTAs having the media around and they asked me like, what, hey, what are your goals for being a Cleveland Brown? And I was the third pick in the draft that year. So I think they kind of had certain level of expectations. And for me, I'm the type of person that just looks one day in advance and that's it. Like, I don't think too far down the line uh, other than having some goals. And so for me, it was like, Hey, I want to become a starter. I want to make the pro bowl. I want to win a super bowl. And I want to go to the hall of fame. Like to me, that was just like sort of the natural progression. Mm -hmm. And I think they were on board with the first few, but when I said, I want to go to the hall of fame, I think the Cleveland media was taken aback a little bit and they were like, hmm? uh, let's, let's worry about winning a game here before you go to the hall of fame there, buddy. Um, but it turns out that it was a little bit harder to win a game than it was for me to get to the <laughs> hall of fame. So it's kind of ironic how things shook out, but I would say during my career, I never really thought about it or stressed about it until year 10, when I was elected to my 10th straight pro bowl, which made me the first offensive lineman in history to achieve that mark to start their season or start their career. And then once I broke past 10,000 career consecutive snaps, uh, which was an NFL record, I knew that those two things were going to be pretty hard to keep me out of the hall of fame. Once I had those on my resume. I know 
I know that you know already and you can't tell us and I respect it. I, <laughs> I just imagine that Roger Goodell, like if you started talking about it, that you just get hit in the neck with a blow dart. Just, <laughs> just, <laughs> what happened? What happened to Joe? But yes. hypothetically speaking. All right, we'll do it. When, if you are, if, if on Thursday night you are elected the Hall of Fame, especially as a first ballot Hall of Famer, what what will that mean to you? Well, being a first ballot Hall of Famer puts you in a special area within the Hall of Fame. And Deion Sanders has talked about it. And it's one of those things that you've, hear, you've heard players talk about in the last few years a little bit more, especially after that big centennial class where they let more people in than they normally do. Uh, and you heard some of the Hall of Famers talk about how it just means a little bit more because that means that nobody had to plead your case for you to get in when you were a first ballot. They said your name and everybody knew who you were and they knew that they couldn't tell the story of the NFL without you. So potentially getting in on my first ballot would put me in rarefied air among, I think, seven or so offensive tackles that have ever gotten in in NFL history on the first ballot. I think there's something around 70 total Hall of Famers that got in on their first ballot. So I would never say, oh, you know, this jacket is gold and it means more than yours because I was a first ballot and you weren't or vice versa. But it definitely means a little bit more. It's a yeah. little bit more special, I think, when you do get in on your first opportunity because, you know, let's face it in life and with our careers, we're competitive people. We're always trying to one up the other person. Um, you're always trying to seek, how can I be the greatest of the great? Like that's what your goal is always throughout your athletic career. And I think the pinnacle of individual accomplishment for football players is being a first ballot hall of famer. And most people would say, no, it's just being a hall of famer, but there is a class within the class. It's so interesting how like we kind of operate as humans that there's no matter what, there's always a hierarchy. Yeah. Right. Even like you go into a locker room, <laughs> there's going to be a hierarchy. That's you right. make it to the hall of fame. Like even in the hall of fame, the, there's still always going to be a hierarchy of the guys that were first ballot. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's fascinating to me, but it's still special. And, and the group of guys, and I was talking with Gabe about it. It, the NFL Hall of Fame, like to me, maybe I'm a football guy, but the difficulty with the injuries and so much that happens in football to make it to the Hall of Fame, I think it's the most exclusive there is. Yeah, and I, the hierarchy thing is is funny because we're always like comparing ourselves and to some of our detriment a little bit. Like human nature, when when we make comparisons, we I always say it's the thief of joy. Like just enjoy being you and be the best version of yourself. But there is that part of you that just can't help it, right? No matter where you are, you're always putting yourself in the pecking order. Even if you don't, order. everyone else is going to right, be exactly. putting you there. Yeah. And when I do get inducted to the Hall of Fame, if I'm lucky enough to make it on the first ballot and I'm with those guys, that doesn't mean I'm going to feel like I'm deserving or one of the crew, right? Because there is still that part of human nature where you have that little imposter syndrome. And it's something I battled my whole career. And I, I'm sure you guys had it the same way when you get those accolades, you feel like, oh, maybe I'm not deserving of it, or maybe I'm not as good as those guys, especially the guys that you watched growing up, the Walter Joneses, the Orlando Paces, the Willie Rofes, the Anthony Munoz is like to be in their community of Hall of Famers, of first ballot Hall of Famers, potentially. I would, I'm never going to feel like I belong or I deserve it, right? Because those are where the idols, those were the guys that were on the top of the mountain when I was growing up and learning this position. Um, but yeah, just like being in the locker room, like you see the captain, the senior captain over there when you're in college and you're looking at him, you're like, Whoa, that dude's unbelievable. Like I'll never be as great as him. Or I'll never be as cool as him. Uh, and it is just part of human nature, but it is fun to kind of start reflecting uh, on the doorstep of the hall of fame back on all those greats that you watched that you put up on those pedestal when you were a kid and when you were learning this game. You're going to party so hard all weekend. I can't <laughs> I'm going to be so tired. My voice is going to be so shot on Monday when I come home. I'm going to be worthless for like three days. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can run into you because we're oh. Caroline and I are making the trip. So Fantastic. we're going to do waste management Saturday. We'll go to the game Sunday. Hopefully, awesome. hopefully I can find you. It, it should be easy to spot you in that gold jacket. So it shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk about the game, man. 
Mm, let's and do it. Uh, clearly, your expertise is offensive line play. You think that Kansas City offensive line can hold up against Hassan Reddick, Fletcher Cox? That what what that Eagles defensive front has got? It's so funny because you think about you know when we do these shows in the regular season, and so much we talk about is the quarterbacks, the pass catchers, maybe the pass rushers. It's all about stopping the passing game, it seems like. But more times than not, for whatever reason, it seems like when you get into these Super Bowl matchups, the conversations always turn to the line play. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. I haven't been able to th- put my thumb on it specifically. But here we are again in a Super Bowl matchup that's going to come down to offensive and defensive lines. And you got the Philadelphia Eagles, the best line in the NFL. They've stayed remarkably healthy for most of the season. Uh, They got all their studs out there in this game going against a Chiefs defensive line, who's pretty good. They've got probably maybe the defensive player of the year in Chris Jones, who's made a difference for that team for several years and certainly has been a huge part of closing out games this year where, hey, they get the lead with Patrick Mahomes. Now, hey, Chris, it's your job. Go out, get the sacks end the game for us uh but he's gonna meet his match because there's no weaknesses on this philadelphia eagles offensive line it's not like he can go over the guard or then switch out over the tackle and go against um layton johnson or any of the guys in that offensive line that have made multiple pro bowls and all pros so it's going to be a big challenge for him because he's one of those guys that he's a great player but as an interior defensive lineman, you can move them around and find those matchups that you like and use that to your advantage. It's something they're not going to be able to do in this game on Sunday. Uh, and the difficulty that it's going to present Kansas City's defense whenever you combine an offensive line uh, as good as Philly has with a quarterback that can run like Jalen Hurts, mm. it puts you in a bind defensively. Like, Do you add extra guys to the rush? And, and possibly expose yourself where a quarterback could step up and have a ton of room to run downfield? Or do you sit back and try and kind of spread the net and keep everything in front of you, but that's going to be lighter on the rush? Like, how do you think Kansas City is going to attack it that way? Just, you know, as, as we always hear, just try to be multiple. Yeah, I think they want to be multiple. And I think at first what they're going to try to do is make Jalen Hurts a pocket passer, right? Because that's one of the things he doesn't do the best. Like, He's a great runner. He's really good when he has the RPO opportunities. Um, But if you just make him be a Tom Brady statue in the pocket, that's what he doesn't have the most experience doing. And he's not one of the top five guys throwing from within the pocket. But you put all the pieces together, and that's why he's an MVP candidate, right? Because he does the RPO. He does provide a significant threat running the football. And, oh, by the way, if you try to take some of that stuff away, that's when he starts hitting you uh, down the field with some of his stud receivers like A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith, guys who both had over a 1,000 yards receiving this season. So they're multiple on offense, and I think that's how you beat them on defense. You try to be multiple. You try to f- somehow keep Jalen Hurts in the pocket, but that's where those RPOs come in, and that's why it's so difficult to defend. Teddy, you would know this, like – as soon as you want to try to play man coverage and put more dudes in the box, all of a sudden now they can target the person who can go and make them be in conflict. And now that guy doesn't know if it's a run, if it's a quarterback pull design run, or if he's throwing over the top of my head. And so that split second that you're buying, you're slowing everybody down on the defense. And then that's where these huge holes and these huge windows show up because they've got some really talented pass catchers on the outside that can get free if you do try to play those man coverages. Looking at Kansas City's offense against that Philadelphia defense, right? And right, the game within the game is that O line versus that Philly D line. But what what do you think? What do you think is the best way for Kansas City to attack Philadelphia? Because that that front seven is legit, but it's not like they have a bunch of weaknesses in the back end. So, what? How do you think? What What do you think Andy Reid will do with Mahomes in that offense to try to exploit? Philly's defense yeah I think really the only matchup that the Eagles are going to try to exploit is Hassan Reddick on Andrew Wiley their right tackle Um, he was a guy that was actually with me in Cleveland and he does a nice job but he's not at that Pro Bowl level that you usually need to be able to limit a guy like Hassan Reddick who's uh, you know, a 20 sack guy on the season who's a dynamic pass rusher and can beat you in multiple ways and he's got the speed that once he beats his block 
he can get after Patrick Mahomes, you know, even as quick as Patrick Mahomes is, he's a guy that's difficult to get down, but Hassan Reddick will be able to chase him down. So that's one of those matchups that I think the chiefs are really concerned about. And so for me, it's going to come down to Travis Kelsey in the middle of the field versus the Eagles, right? Because how how are the Eagles going to handle when they put two tight ends on the field? Are they going to treat Travis Kelsey like he's a tight end? Are they going to treat him like a receiver? Are they going to try to put uh, one of their safeties on him and and try to go small and go athletic? Well, then you might see the Chiefs try to run the football a little bit more. But if they um, try to take away – some of the stuff in in the middle of the field from with Travis, if they put an extra guy in the box now, I think that's when you're going to try to get down the field. Uh, but for the Eagles, they're in a good position, right? Because their pass rush is really good. And I think one of the stories that maybe we haven't talked about enough is how the chiefs receivers are pretty banged up coming into this game. McCole Hardman is out. Uh, and then there are other guys that they've been leaning on most of the season, like Juju Smith, Schuster, Kadarius, Tony, those guys came out of the AFC championship game banged up. So it'll be interesting to see. I think the Eagles are going to dare them to try to throw the football down the field a little bit and prove that those guys are healthy enough to win in some man to man coverage down the field. Now that's, I, I think that's an interesting point with, you know, the, the D line from Philly being able to chase Mahomes down. If he does get outside the pocket, you know, he does have the ankle, which, you know, he looked okay uh, in the in the AFC Championship game, made a couple of throws on the run, and he's had some extra time to heal up. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. But is it me, or has Mahomes become a less effective outside the pocket? You know, he's got the receivers that are going to be banged up, and it feels like Tyreek Hill, like that was the real, he would get out, scramble around Tyreek Hill you'd lose him in the secondary and they'd hit your way downfield it just doesn't feel like they've been as dangerous without him in that in that regard have you seen the same thing yeah they don't have as many chunk plays as they used to right because they had the cheetah they had the fastest man in football out there but without him Mahomes is not taking the chances that he was in the past where he would try to run around extend plays because he knew hey if I can get to four and a half or five seconds into the play on the shot clock like my guy's going to get open. Nobody can cover this guy. And and if God bless them, they take two safeties and just turn and run them towards the end zone. Like there's going to be a lot of free space, a lot of green grass underneath for Travis Kelsey and these other receivers who are pretty good. And so that was always their formula. And I think Patrick Mahomes leaned on that a little bit, maybe at times more than he should. And it caused a few more turnovers and, um, they're actually a better offense this year, in my opinion, because they're more well-rounded without Tyreek Hill. They're the number one points, total yards, pass yards, pass passer rating to offense in the NFL this year. And you don't do that by not mastering all the X's and O's and the fundamentals of Andy Reid's offense. And that's where I think Patrick Mahomes and this offense has gotten better this year is there's less risks being taken. So they're not turning the football over quite as much. And within that offense, I think they're more rhythmic and more robotic, and they can beat you in multiple different ways based on the plays that are going in there. And it's not just backyard street ball with Patrick Mahomes to Tyree Kill anymore. A lot of times it's like, hey, this is the specific play, the look we want to get. And they're much more, I think, in tune to the details. And it's made Patrick Mahomes, in my opinion, a better quarterback because he can still get outside the pocket like we saw in the game two weeks ago where he can get outside the pocket, he can beat you with his legs, and he's got those crazy arm angles, but he doesn't have to do that anymore. They don't have to rely on those. Looking looking at the coaching matchup, right? We're only a few years removed from Belichick breaking Sean McVay's brain, right? <laughs> How how valuable or how important do you think it is that Andy Reed has been here? He's done it as a head coach. And then, I mean, just Nick Sirianni, he's pressed all the right buttons this season, but he just hasn't been on this stage. So Mitchell Schwartz and I, who do a podcast every Monday and he was with the chiefs a few years ago when they won the super bowl, he was their right tackle. Uh, we were talking about this very thing earlier on in the week, and he said that he thought Andy Reid's experience in the Super Bowl, going all the way back when he was the Eagles head coach, really made a huge difference in the Super Bowl that they won when Mitch was there. Because he said all week, Andy was really good at letting them understand, hey, this is it's still football, guys, all right? But there are going to be some differences, but not make a huge deal about the differences, but emphasize them by saying, like, look, the time between – when you normally come out of the tunnel 
and then the national anthem and all the hoopla that happens before kickoff. It's going to be a lot longer. So don't go out there. We know everyone's going to be excited. Don't go out there and blow a bunch, blow through a bunch of energy because you're so excited, like warming up and taking sprints up and down the field and jumping around, like find a way in practice to go through a little routine. This is how much time you have and figure out what that routine is mentally, where you're able to focus on the game. You're going to able to be warm when the kickoff happens, but you're not just blowing through a ton of energy. That's nervousness that you don't normally get in a regular game. And they actually practice it during the week and they go through the exact same thing. They do like the mock game where you're actually doing a full on practice of how long their halftime is. And he breaks it down into five minute segments. Whereas a normal halftime in the NFL, like you guys know, it's like you're in there, you grab an orange and you're out of there and you're back on the field. Maybe the coaches holler at you about two things that you're not even paying attention to because half the guys are in the bathroom taking a leak. The other guys are getting their ankles taped by the trainer and the two or three guys that are paying attention on the practice squad and they're not even playing anyway. So if there's that really nothing totally that happens. Me. That was Gabe. <laughs> there was really nothing that really happens during a regular season or even a, a normal playoff game during halftime. But because the halftime show is so long, you actually have time to get stuff done. And so Andy Reid breaks it down in these five minute segments. He coaches them up on it. He emphasizes it during the week. They go through it during their practice as if it is a halftime. And so I think those guys are very well prepared for the differences in a Super Bowl matchup versus a lot of these other teams where coaches maybe are new to it or haven't been through it as many times as Andy Reid has. You know, it's it's fascinating. There are some guys that, you know, left from Philly from that, that Super Bowl run that they had, but I think it's different whenever you have the top-down approach. So it's interesting. I, I guess as you take everything in and just kind of look at the the overall scope of the game, do you have a side that you're leaning uh, as things sit right now? Yeah, I think going into the game, I was thinking the Eagles because of their dominance on the O and D line. Like Chris Jones has been the equalizer on that Chiefs defense, and I don't think he's going to be able to get home much against this Eagles offensive line. Um, and then the Eagles defensive line, it's it's not a good matchup for anybody that wants to throw the football. And certainly the Chiefs have been solid uh, all season long, but there are going to be some weaknesses. There are going to be moments when they're going to get home. But to me, the thing that really tipped – uh, the scales in my favor is the fact that the Chiefs receivers are pretty banged up. Um, and the Eagles have a great secondary, Darius Slay, James Bradbury, Avante Maddox. Those guys are studs against a healthy receiver core. Um, and I just think that when you come into a game and you're in a, a mash unit in your receiver core and that's what you kind of rely on is throwing the football, I think that might be just a little bit too much for the Chiefs to overcome. Yeah. It's it's gonna be a good one, Joe. Man, it's always it's always great catching up. And I know you can't say anything, but congrats on the Hall of Fame, man. That's <laughs> I I think you're the first. You got to be the first guy that I actually played with that's getting inducted in the Hall of Fame, right? It's got to be the case. For I me. would think so. I mean, the only guy that has gotten in that was from my class or younger so far, I think, is Calvin Johnson. Oh, well, never mind. I played with Calvin in Detroit. So you're there the you second. Go. So guy. I'm the second. Oh, man. Damn. I could have put that on my resume. Damn. Damn. Hey, it, it's all right. <laughs> Gabe Eichert's first Hall of Famer he played with. <laughs> but nonetheless, thank you for the great honor and the congratulations of being on the show. It's been truly wonderful. I hope to do it again soon, my friends. Probably the awesome. most important thing that will happen to you this week. <laughs> there's no doubt you're the man Thanks, just seated. appreciate it guys we'll talk to you later i love that man he's stud. the best absolute stud hall of fame that's cool yeah it's <laughs> cool yeah it's it's like the uh, i don't know baseball is pretty exclusive but it is not you have to be a special special dude to make it to the NFL Hall of Fame. And there's no doubt he checks that box. No doubt. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, students prepare to meet their potential with an individualized academic path that strives for success. Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSAA athletics where they've won over 100 state championships, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, 
Contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Man, I had to go with OU Women's Hoops. Uh, had a thrilling overtime victory over Baylor, which, by the way, it's the first uh, back-to-back Baylor wins for any Big 12 team since 2010. That's crazy, and I know that's the Mulkey era, but uh, still really, really impressive. Um, it's the 11th double-digit comeback in the Bronchek era, which is crazy. They're 3-0 and in overtime under Baranchek, which is awesome. They've scored 90 points in each of their last four Big 12 wins. Um, Taylor Robinson, we all, all also know that she just uh, became the NCAA's all-time three-point leader. She also just tied the mark, 140th career start, ties the record at Oklahoma. Um, and don't forget they're playing uh, at Kansas State Sunday at 1 o'clock on ESPNU. Now, for the game, did you see the end of this game? Yes, I did. I was watching it, and I'm a big fan of Baylor turning the ball over the way they did late in that game. (laughs) So for those that didn't see it, um, Oklahoma trailed for over 39 minutes of that game. Um, They're down 12 with five minutes to go. They're down 75-63, and they're down five with just 26 seconds to go. They get a defensive stop. They get a layup, then they get a steal on the inbounds, and Taylor Robertson, as she does, hits a big-time three with 14 seconds left to tie it, and they go on to to win it in overtime. Thought that was awesome. Chris Plank's call is fantastic. Seeing him going crazy at the scorer's table on that three is really cool. That was it was a it was a really fun game. That was that video of Plank losing it, like in the background of Robertson's <laughs> yeah. shot, is incredible. Uh, but, I love watching coaches, you know, uh, coach Baranchek is when, when Taylor Robertson hits the three, there's like a quick fist pump and then right back into like screaming at the players, get back, get back. We're not foul. It's, it was awesome. It was just a really cool exchange and this team is fun, man. They score points in the bunches, man. They're 19 and four. Crazy, and and right? I know that, you know, we talk a lot about the men's team on here. We should probably focus more on the women's. They keep my blood pressure down for the most part. Now, last night was an exception. That was a thriller. Blood pressure was up. They're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And the number one reason they're fun to watch, they scored the damn basketball. Yep. Which is very entertaining. And without, with with what happened the other night in Morgantown, uh, Come on, Jenny Baranchek, lead us to the promised land. We need it. Oh, you basketball fans need it. Yeah. Hey, I've said this before. The I think they were, I think they were just uh, you know, like preliminary or temporary changes to try it out. But I think with what they did with women's basketball, kind of following the NBA rules for for quarters and and like bonus and fouls and stuff like that, I think it's helped. Uh, you know, scoring and making it a uh, a really good product. So uh, I think they've done a really good job with it. And you're right. Uh, this team is good, worthy of our attention. And because they score so much and they can hit the three, they're da- they're going to be a dangerous tournament team. I'm a big Skylar Van fan. 
Yeah. I like – she can ball. I like the way she plays. But, Coach Baranchek, you have our attention. We will be monitoring women's soups uh, more closely. Very cool. It was good. All right, who do you have as your loser of the week? Well, I don't know. I – Kind of the Chiefs, but really not really. It's just, did you see what Brandon Ayuk said? I When asked about like who's going to win the Super Bowl, you know, they lost to the Eagles. So I, it's almost like just a shot, like he's mad at the Eagles. But he said the Chiefs are going to win. He doesn't gamble, but if he did, if he was betting on the game, he'd sell his home. He'd take every single dollar to his name and bet it on the Chiefs to win, which is the ultimate curse, right? <laughs> Whenever somebody says something like that, you know how it's going to unfold, which, you know, I, I know that it has no, no bearing on the outcome of the game, but it's just, I thought it was a, was a crazy statement because I think it's going to be a great game and it's, I, I have no idea who's going to win. I, I think I think the Eagles are the better football team. But I want no part of betting against Patrick Mahomes. None. I okay. will be respectfully declining wagering any of my own money on this game because I just, I don't know. They're, I, they are always in it no matter what the score is and no matter how much time is left on the clock. Yeah, and I, I will say this would help the chiefs if they had brandon Ayuk. that dude is legit i mean yeah. i think he's one of the best route runners in the league he he's is great. he's great he's and he's the perfect he's like the perfect complement to like debo samuel and like just they're they'd kittle like the whole they like check every single box on their skill position guys do do you think nick seriani like paid him to say that or something maybe <laughs> I don't know because the Eagles are favored. You know, you think, I don't know. I don't know. You think he's like, Hey, Brandon, say something crazy so I can use it in a meeting. It's like I, motivation and do one of my cheese ball things. Like, come on, let come on, help me out. You know, the, the Eagles, I know Jalen hurts gets a lot of attention and he should, but the real, like the real strength of that team is how great they're on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Yep. Offensive line. Really, really good defensive line, super, super productive. Like that's the that's the real uh, strength of that football team. Yep. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first, John Vance Auto Group has been serving Oklahomans for forty years. They're family owned and operated, and they got nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. No matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way, which is why they have their lifetime loyalty program. And here's how it works. You buy a new or used car from them, and all you have to do is get all of the manufacturer-recommended maintenance done at the Vance dealership. And if something goes wrong with your components of your engine, transmission, drive, axle, or transfer unit, they're going to cover the repair costs. It's a great deal. You can browse their entire inventory or find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. Make your life easy, people, and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. All right, for my winner of the week, thought about going with Aaron Rodgers. I just The, the dude has really leaned in. To being a weirdo, and I I respect that. <laughs> like, if you're gonna do it, go all in. What What do you think about the four day darkness retreat to decide what he's gonna do next season? Hey, I'm gonna make a prediction. He's owed like sixty million dollars next year. This just in, I think he's gonna play in 2023, the 2023 2024 season. 
bold prediction. Aaron Rodgers will be playing football. Now, if, is it the Packers? Is it the Jets? I, I don't know, but he doesn't need to sit in the dark for four days. I, I could have just told him he's going to do it. It's $60 million. Yeah, nothing better than sitting in the dark for four days and thinking about where you're going to spend the $63 million you're going to make next year, right? Um, I actually, to me, four days alone in the dark doesn't sound all that bad. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it kind of sounds a little bit refreshing to clear the system, get away from the phone, all of those things. But yeah, he's, um, I know he said no ayahuasca on this trip, but I'm not buying it, you know? No. There's going to be some drugs involved. Let's be real, A-Rod. Come There's on, man. There's going to be some type of enhancement going it, on here. If I'm going, if I'm trying to go on some type of spiritual journey, I want it to be, do you watch Yellowstone? No. Okay, well, I there's uh, Casey Dutton on the show, uh, goes on like this vision quest with the Native Americans there. If I'm ever doing like, that's that's the type of journey I want to go on with all the ayahuasca. So not peyote. Not, uh, this is this is when Aaron Rodgers was describing it. He's like, "Yeah, you just sit in the dark, like in a house. Now meals get delivered to you, and you can leave when you want, but you don't." I was like, "That's just like having a newborn. That <laughs> that's being a parent, dude. Those first couple of weeks where you're just afraid to make any sound. <laughs> you rocking. You're your just baby. sitting in silence. People are bringing you food. That's that's having a newborn baby. That's what it is." No, I don't think he's a parent, so he doesn't understand. But I was listening to the description. I was like, no, no, no. I, I've done, I have done the four day darkness retreat. It's, That's it's when we great. had our son. Like you, you're scared to see any light or make any noise. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think he's gonna play. I saw everyone uh, saying that uh, linking the darkness retreat to with the black hole for the Raiders, so that he's just he's telling everyone where he's going. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, the only other Aaron Rodgers thing is, do you see what Keith Mitchell said? Cause they, he, he won that Pebble beach pro-am. Yeah. Keith Mitchell straight up accusing him of sandbagging with that handicap, man. That's, that is a, that's an accusation in the golf world, man. That's a right. big accusation. Well, I'm sorry. Um, you know, Josh Allen, the problem with the deep playoff run is not a lot of golf happening, right? You know, you don't make the playoffs. I'm sure Aaron Rodgers has been in some nice, nice weather, getting some rounds of golf in, practicing. So that's an advantage. Yeah, but I did see it's like the Green Bay Country Club. His handicap's like a 3.8, and he was playing on a 10 at the Pro-Am. Hmm. It's awfully, uh, it's awfully well, generous, Ted. I don't know. <sighs> Maybe they factor in like, hey, this guy's probably going to be on ayahuasca. We need to give him a couple more shots. Right. I'm try I'm also thinking like I wonder how difficult the Green Bay Country Club is. It's a good point. Like I don't I don't know like do they adjust your handicap at all with the slope rating of the course or I don't know any of that stuff, but yeah, I'd say 3 to a 10 is that's sandbagger-ish. No doubt. My winner of the week, though, LeBron James. It, it And I know a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions on LeBron, but guy's been incredible. Breaks the all-time scorer record. I thought it was really cool that it was against the Thunder. I know there are a lot of people like, oh, we don't want it to be broken against the Thunder. I was like, yes, let him pour it in. I, I mean, it's it's just a cool little note in history, right? But from the expectations – that people had for him, for him to exceed them the way that he did. It's one of the most impressive things ever in sports. It just, just an incredible accomplishment to, to pass Kareem on the scoring list. And I don't know, just watching it on the count. It felt like it almost felt like a playoff game in a weird way because of the energy of the crowd. And I actually enjoyed that. They stopped the game and let him have that moment because it's just an insane accomplishment. It, it, it really is. And the best part about it, the Thunder won the game, Ted. Let's go. I, I mean, so LeBron got the record. We got to witness that. 
And then a lot of people got to witness the young core of the Thunder and realized that this team is – it's not going to be long before this team is humming. I mean, SGA, just a casual 30. If Giddy can just cut down on a few of those turnovers, like that dude is playing way more aggressively and way more confident on the offensive end. Jalen Williams, certified stud as a rookie, but – Congrats, LeBron. Congrats on the record and hold this L, my man. Let's go. That's isn't that like the greatest? It's just you got LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Russell Westbrook. You've got these names, and like to get the all time scoring title in a loss to a team that like, I agree with you. They're on the come up. Like there's a lot of really good things for the future for Oklahoma city thunder right now, but as they're viewed by most people nationally, like they're just flat out, not a good team at all. All right. To get that record in a loss at home to the thunder is just such a, like a weird dichotomy, isn't it? It it's a perfect summary of how the season is going for the Lakers. Yeah. And also do you see Anthony Davis? With LeBron broke the record? No. It's like a video of him. He was on the bench when it happened. Just kind of sat. Didn't even celebrate. It was very awkward and odd. I, You would think he would at least clap, but I don't know. There's some, there's some weird stuff in Westbrook. <laughs> Westbrook played that game like LeBron tried to trade him a couple days ago. <laughs> So I don't know, man, but an amazing accomplishment. But I was I was glad that the Thunder were in that spotlight. And to see that, I mean, remember, this is what, like the second youngest team in the history of the NBA or something crazy like that? Yeah. To see them respond in that moment and play the way that they did, it was cool. I enjoyed well, it. It would have been awesome to be there and witness it like this, like everyone else in the in the stands. Do you see that picture? Where they're all just all you see is phones everywhere. Do you see? Do you see the one guy without his phone? The one dude down there on the was that Trey Young? Two seats from him. No, that I think that wait to his left or to his right. As you're looking at it, sitting to his left to the camera to like on the to the right. No, of the, him I think picture. those were LeBron's kids. Oh, okay. But <laughs> well, I screwed that up. Yeah, that is uh, that's Phil Knight, dude. Oh, really? The old guy sitting there just soaking it all in. Okay. I saw a lot of people like, look at this old man. He just like, like living in the moment. It's like, yeah, no shit. It's Phil Knight. <laughs> he started awesome. Nike. Well, Hey, he's, uh, he's taking it in the right way. Uh, that's just a, it's kind of a sad indictment on where we are as a society. Really? Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I, I've got a strict, like, hey, get your picture or your video that you're going to post on Instagram or Twitter early in the game and then put your phone away. That's where I'm yep. at. Yep. That policy started this year, I think, because I, I don't know. I get why people want that video, but it you never go back and watch it. This is the thing. See, that's, that is the big lie. The big lie is, oh, I want the video – you know, to be able to go like, like it's a great memory, but that's not why anyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it so they can post it and try and get likes. That's why they're actually doing it. It's like, Oh my God, I've got this. I got to, everyone will like this, that I'm here at this for this moment. And that's kind of why, in my opinion, it gets done for the most part. There are some people that are just recording it to keep it, but yeah, I think it's overwhelmingly to post. I am. I'm with you. All right. For my loser of the week, thought about going with Kevin Durant. Everyone told him attaching himself to Kyrie Irving was not a good idea. Kyrie demands a trade. Kyrie Kyrie gets traded to the Mavs. We'll see how that works out with Kyrie and Luca. I think it could be a beautiful disaster, but seems like Kevin Durant's not particularly happy. And uh, he really has no one to blame but himself and Kyrie, of course. But we all kind of saw this coming, right? Well, Kyrie has left a uh, 
a wake of destruction in his path wherever he's been in recent years. So, yeah, I think everyone could see this one coming. And Luca's probably like, oh, my God, no. Please, no. It's not going to end well there. There's no way. There's It'll no be way. like a brief moment of, oh, wow, this is awesome. Look how happy Kyrie is and how, you know, how, how wonderful it's all working. And then it's just going to be one thing after another and dysfunction at the end. But for my loser of the week, Anadarko basketball coach, Doug Shumpert. Oof. This really bothered me. And I know this guy has done this stuff for years now. Right. And I know he's won a lot of games. I'm here to tell everyone I do not care because, and if you miss it, Anna Darko played keep away against Weatherford in a high school basketball game on Tuesday night. The final score was four to two. You heard that correctly. Weatherford four, Anna Darko two. And I don't want to hear about how good of a career, what type of coaching legend Shumpert is. I don't want to hear it. This, this ain't it, man. Some people want to make the argument, well, he was putting his players in the best chance to win the game, like putting them in the best position to win the game. That's, that's not what this is all about. I know some people think winning is everything. Right, I'm as competitive as they come, man. But high school basketball is supposed to be about kids trying their best and having fun. And if you win, that's awesome. If you don't, it's okay. But I don't believe there's anything positive that comes from doing what he had those kids do on Tuesday night. And I can't believe that people are sticking up for him. I can't believe those parents at Anadarko let this happen. Hell, I can't believe that the high school kids comply. Maybe that's the most impressive part is that he can convince all these kids to play keep away for four quarters, but let them play the game, man. If they lose, if Weatherford's more talented, that's sports. It's okay if you lose to a team that's more athletic and more talented than you. But let them play the game. Having them sit in the corners and throwing it back and forth. And someone put the entire game, sped it up and put it on the internet. And to people that were like, oh, they ran a little offense. Bullshit. They passed it back and forth at the top over and over and over and over again for the entire game. This is not what sports are about. It's not what you're supposed to be teaching high school kids. Nothing, there is no value in making those kids do that. And I will argue anyone that wants to say that there is. It's supposed to be about letting kids play and letting them have a good time. There's no way that was fun for those players. And they pulled that stunt and lost. So what's it matter if you lose by two or lose by 20? Let the kids play the damn game. I was I was stunned that people stood up for that coach. And I was just, I was sad for the kids, man. I was sad that it's a damn shame that those kids had to do that. I hated it for them. It's a it's a real short-sighted approach. I I can I can understand at least I can understand to to a degree the philosophy that this gave them the best opportunity to win. Like, I don't know anything about Weatherford, and I don't know anything about Anadarko. And had they played a normal game and they got beat, you know, 65 to 20, like, this, this was a, a way to get them close to winning the game. Like, I can understand that philosophy to a point. But in in high school, Like the whole point really of sports in general, and especially as you're young is like, learn what you're good at, learn what you're bad at, learn what you need to improve, learn how to handle uh, victory, learn how to handle defeat, know how to grow as a person from it, know how to grow as a team from it. 
And this accomplishes none of those things. You don't develop any skill. You don't find out where you need to get better. You don't find out what areas that you have that are are good and you can use to your advantage. You don't learn how to grow as a team. You don't learn how to to bring each each other up. Uh, and it, it's just it's a total it's a total wasted effort across the board in every single metric, except for possibly it gave us the best chance to keep it close. And as you pointed out, it failed in in that aspect of it. You still lost the game and you got doubled up four to two. It's nobody learned anything. Nobody got better. It was a, it's a total, it's a stunt that impedes the growth of your own team and the team that you're playing against. It's a, it's a worthless endeavor that I hope I never see again. And I don't care if he convinced the kids that this is a great thing to do. And I don't care if he convinced the parents that this is a great thing to do. It's not. You need, like, if that's where you are as a basketball team, you need to spend some time developing something else other than keep away. Let them play, man. Yep. Let it, let them, let them try their best to go put the ball in the basket. Let them try their best to defend Weatherford. And I had, I had a guy that officiated that game DM me on Twitter and said that the Weatherford fans, this is a quote, the Weatherford fans did the loudest boo I have ever heard at halftime. It was two to nothing at the half. And he also said that Weatherford has a, you know, has a really athletic team. I guess they've got a sophomore that OU's already offered for football. Who knew? But I, and this has become a national story, and I'm glad. And there's a lot of people talking about this. And if you're looking for one positive, hopefully it leads to Oklahoma high school basketball implementing a shot clock so that this can never happen again. I, I think that's long overdue. And, and I was thinking about it last night. Well, my son, what, he's about 13 years or so from being in high school. I, I will make it one of my life's goal to make sure there's a shot clock before he gets to high school. Yeah. But I just, I, I don't know, man. I saw, I saw this last night. It just rubbed me the wrong way. It made me sad. Like I felt a lot of different emotions because I, I just can't imagine being a coach right at the high school level. And you're you're shaping these young men as people, not not, not only as players, but as people. Like your, your high school, think back. Like your high school coaches are incredibly influential in your life. And, and for him to say, you know what, I've got this group of young men. Let's play keep away. I just think it's one of the most chicken shit things I've ever seen, dude. I yep. I, I don't care how many guy how many games the guys won. This ain't it. This is not the way. And if if letting them play isn't the best way to give them a chance to win, then so be it. Yep. Just let it let it be that way. Let let the kids play the game and have fun. If they lose, they lose. But I really think Trying to make kids have this mentality. I don't know, man. I feel like it's detrimental. I really do. I, I don't know. It really, it really bothered me. And still clearly is bothering me. Yeah. Well, I, I think ultimately that it, it, because there's been a lot of people, this isn't the first time people have been clamoring for a shot clock in high school hoops in Oklahoma. Right. And and I don't know like how many states out there have it and like are we the only one that doesn't? And you know, there's there's always the argument that gets thrown back, well, some schools can't afford to put in a a, a shot clock. How about this? When, I just dis- when the I don't time comes at all. When the time comes, like if it's still not in, 
I'll pay for it. <laughs> I I will. I'll, I'll like, I've saved I've saved a lot of money. I'll pay for them. And like, if my son gets to high school and they're still not shot clocks, and the reason is, hey, they they can't afford them. I'll buy them all. I well, I know they can afford them. I, I know see, they can too. I see the I see the weight rooms that these high schools have. I know that there's how many two A and three A schools out there have turf football fields. You. That argument to me is null and void. Should there be a handful of schools out there that can't afford shot clocks? I'm sure there's a way to get it done. I am on the board of the West Welker Foundation. We will gladly, we will gladly fulfill grants for schools, public schools here in Oklahoma City that want shot clocks. Now there I'm speaking go. for the whole foundation. Probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> but I think if it came to like, I think I could, I could convince the group. There you go. But I, I just, oh, it really pissed me off, man. And it, it made me even more upset that some people were defending that. Oh my gosh. Gives them the well, best chance to win. There, I, there, there is definitely a, there's a, there's, there's a point to where, Hey, as an outman team, let's do what we can. Let's find the loopholes. Let's let's use the rules of the game in our favor to level the playing field. Like, and I'll hear that. That's what that's what's happening in college football right now, right? That that's that's what what teams have done in college football. Is but use but the in rules. college football, you're forced to play the game. Like, you got to snap it. Right. You got to play. No doubt. Like, e even if you're leaning on the run game. Even if you're a triple option, dude, like you got to play, you got to block, you got to tackle, you have to play. If In this there case, was... there's no, they're, they're, you're not even playing the sport. You're playing, right. you're playing keep away. You're playing hot potato. What you've done is you've, you've, you found a, a, a hole in the in the old rule set, which I don't know when they came up with the rules or when the last time they updated it or or whatever. It, it's the spirit of the rule is because they they would understand that no one would deliberately not try to score in a game like that they would deliberately hold the ball for entire periods of the game like that's not why like whenever the rules were written i can't imagine that that was intended with the spirit of the rule set and I most everywhere else in the world, in any other organization, would change it instantly. Like if this is what it created. OSSAA. Make it's it really right. their fault. Because this change has been it. going on for a long time. Change it. Don't allow, don't make a group of basketball players in this state have to go through that again. Because you can't convince me. Like that, that was not fun. For those kids, there's no Can I ask way. Ask a question: Why, as Weatherford, would you not put down bench players in to go out and foul like crazy? I, I'll just tell you this: When I was a high school basketball player, we were pretty good. I think we just would have fought. <laughs> like I think if a team. Daniel Orton probably would have been, it would have been one of these conversations between me and him. Like, Hey, we're going to fight these guys. Let's do it. Yeah. Just cause that it, imagine having to be Weatherford in that game. You're just sitting there and people are like, well, why didn't they pressure the ball? What, what do you want them to do? <laughs> like, that's I, what I, that's what I, you're almost, I, I would say you just go foul and continue to foul until just go tackle them. Right. Put them on the line. They shoot free throws. If they make them, you get the ball back. If they miss them, you could rebound to get the ball. You continue to do that and go score, score points and, and get them out of it. I guess. I don't know. I I don't know what you do. What What would you have done if you were one of the parents in the stands? I don't think I, I probably wouldn't have done much. I, I Nothing I, I would have, have done would have made things any better other than taking what's a national story and, you know, You'd be the guy in the in the national story I, now doing something bad. I have always said that 
I'm going to be quiet during my kids' games. I can just sit there, watch that. Dude, I know myself. I don't think I would have been able to sit through that without saying something and making some type of scene. Yeah, Whether that makes crazy. me a bad person or not, I don't know. But it would have been – there There would have been at least one loud chant, loud shout of let the kids play the game, something to that effect. And this happened – this was in, in Weatherford, right, I'm guessing? I – where was the game? If there's that many fans there from Weatherford that were booing and stuff, I don't know. I just, yeah, I was at Weatherford. Yeah, if if I was in high school and they would have tried to do that in our gym, we we would have fought. Yeah, I'm, I would have taken the technical, possible ejection. I'd be like, hey, you know, it is what it is. If you win the game, it's it's one thing, but like when you lose it, it just it looks worse to lose the game four to two and, and tried to, you know, play keep away the entire game. It looks worse than if you would have got run out of the gym, like 80 to 20, you know, I am of the belief that refusing to play the game is the worst look imaginable. There's nothing, there's nothing worse than that. Like playing and getting your ass kicked within reason. Like within, if, yes. If yes, you've got a reason. lead, a big lead late, and you're trying to run the clock out, like that's that's within reason. But this, this was from the opening tip, dude. Just pass it back and forth. So do you know how they lost? Anna Darko had a three at the buzzer to win the game and missed it. So they stalled the entire game, even though they were down? Yeah. They were down two to nothing at halftime. They're down. It was four to two at the end of the game. A guy told me that they had a three at the buzzer to try and win it and missed it. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm just going on record right now. Shot clocks. Get them, Oklahoma. Come, come on, Oklahoma. OSSAA. We're all calling you out. Implement the shot clock. So, no kid has to go through this again. And especially no kid has to comply right. with this again. Because what what that coach made those kids do is complete bullshit. Well, and now, the, and now they're like suffering the like It's the not the kid's fault. Right. Just doing what they were coached to do. I don't blame the kids. I also now thinking back to our high school basketball days. If you tried to get us to do that, oh, my God, no <laughs> chance, zero chance, non-compliant to say the least. <laughs> On that note, episode two, 290 in the books, we'll have a new podcast that will drop Sunday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. Enjoy the Super Bowl. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.